Well, good morning, everyone. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 13 specifically. Uh, the passage that we're looking at today is commonly referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Uh, we're not going to be covering the whole Olivet Discourse. It's a little bit longer than we can do just today, but we're going to be hitting on the first part of it. Uh, but the accompanying sister accounts can also be found in Matthew 24 and 25, which is probably the most expansive account of the Olivet Discourse, and Luke 21 as well. But it's called Olivet because for most of this conversation that is transpiring between Jesus and his disciples, they were sitting on the Mount of Olives, which is a ridge line that's just to the east of Jerusalem. And it's called Discourse because uh, Jesus is teaching on a very specific topic. Uh, if you look in your Bibles at the chapter heading, like we like to, our little cheat sheets of what's coming next, tells us about it, a little synopsis there. If you look at that, your cha chapter heading will probably say something along the lines of signs of the end of the age. And so uh, that tells you it's talking about, you know, the, kind of what's coming next. Uh, and this deals with some of the end time stuff too. And so it's a really fascinating um, discourse, this Olivet Discourse. And so Jesus is talking with a few of his disciples about what is going to happen next after his death, burial, and resurrection. He's preparing his disciples for what was to come next. And so the Olivet Discourse begins with Jesus foretelling the coming destruction of the temple. And it concludes with the second coming of Jesus Christ in all of his glory at the end of days. And so it covers the expanse of time over the last 2,000 years up until today and also includes up until when Jesus returns, however much longer we have to go to that. So you can see that it's a very broad period of time that is covered in this one chapter here in Mark or two chapters in the book of Matthew. And uh, so it's very expansive period of time that it's covering. And so you can imagine the amount of uh, conversation that theologians like to have as a result of that. But this conversation between Jesus and the disciples began as they were leaving the temple, leaving the temple mount on Tuesday. Now, Jesus had already had a very busy day with his disciples. They spent the day that Tuesday answering questions from the religious leaders and, and uh, about marriages, taxes, uh, about what's the greatest commandment. You know, we've talked through these in, uh, in previous weeks. But now they are leaving the temple and they're traveling back to their, as Pastor Preston likes to call it, their Airbnb over in Bethany. And so they're traveling back. They've got to go over the Mount of Olives to, to get there. Bethany is on the southeast side of, of the Mount of Olives. And so that's their kind of trajectory. You'll see on the screen behind me here a picture from the Mount of Olives. And it's overlooking the Temple Mount. Uh, it, this is a, a modern day picture. Just make sure that we're all clear. You might see some vehicles in there if you look really closely and, and roads and, and such. Uh, what you see in the foreground there is actually a cemetery. There's a large cemetery that's on the Mount of Olives and it's overlooking Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Talk about a cool place to be buried. That, that's pretty awesome there. But that's the, the cemetery and you can see uh, the modern, uh, what is left of the Temple Mount there. Uh, the, the retaining walls primarily are the original structure that's left from King Herod's temple there. Uh, but you will also see a dome there in the middle that looks like a temple. But please don't mistake that for uh, the temple, the Jewish temple to Yahweh God. Uh, now on top of the Temple Mount, there, is, uh, there has been constructed a mosque. And this is Dome of the Rock. And I think it was constructed in 691 AD. And so you're not seeing the modern temple. You just see the retaining walls for where the Temple Mount and complex would have stood back in the time of Jesus. But one of the things, and it might be hard for you guys to really tell uh, from this picture, but even from this distance, and, and when I was looking at this pic, I could see individual stones in the side of the wall, in the retaining wall of the Temple Mount. And it's, it's really intriguing. And we're going to talk more about that later here. But I want you to just kind of appreciate in some of the pictures, you can see vehicles driving by and the stone, you can see the stones just as distinctly as you can see some of the vehicles. So you can get some of the, the sizes and proportions going on there. And this is zoomed way back, obviously, just kind of give you an idea of what it might have kind of looked like 
for Jesus and his disciples as they are traveling over the Mount of Olives back to Bethany as they are overlooking the temple in Jerusalem, it would have looked something kind of similar to this. And so we're going to go ahead and read Mark and we're going to start, we're going to go verses 1 through 13 ultimately, but right now we're just going to read the first two verses and march through this passage a little bit at a time. And so please read with me on Mark 13 verses 1 through 2. And it says this, as he, Jesus, came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Let's go ahead and pray as we start to discuss this passage together. Uh, Father God, I thank you for this day that you have blessed us with uh, a, a new breath, a new day of life. God, to continue uh, breathing, and I pray that we will use that to glorify you and not only singing your praises, Lord, but but searching your word and asking questions and, and being taught, God. I pray that you will help our hearts to be receptive to your word. I pray that you will help open our eyes up to what you would have for us uh, collectively as a church and also individually, Lord, knowing that you're working in all of our lives and in sometimes very different ways. And so help us to, uh, to be led by your spirit, to understand your word, uh, to be transformed by that, uh, by that, Lord, and so that we can honor and glorify you in all that we do. And we give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have this passage where Jesus is telling his disciple that there's not going to be one of these stones of the temple that's left one on top of the other. There's going to be this destruction of the temple that Jesus is foretelling here. Ultimately, this prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD when Emperor Titus from Rome uh, sacked Jerusalem. There was a big uh, Jewish rebellion. He was squelching that. Uh, I don't think he was trying to destroy the temple. In fact, we're told that uh, Titus and his commanders thought Herod's temple was an amazing architectural feat, and they did not want to, uh, to destroy that. Uh, History is a little bit tricky to fully understand. There's some discrepancies within that, but it seemed like their intent wasn't to destroy the temple. But all the same, due to the, uh, the Romans coming in, sacking Jerusalem because of the Jewish rebellion, through the course of that, there was a fire that was started and the temple ended up being destroyed. And uh, we talked about that a few weeks back, so I'm not going to go into much more detail on that. But what uh, you know, this disciple here in this passage is observing, he's looking at the stonework, the stones as he's coming out of the temple. And he's fascinated, he's, he's in awe, and he's talking to Jesus. He's like, look at these stones. Look at these amazing stones. And my family would fully appreciate this passage, I think. We love stones. We love rocks. Every time we go on vacation, we end up on the beach or somewhere looking for rocks. And, and we come home, and we have tons of little pebbles, sometimes big pebbles, uh, going all over our house. I think Eunice finds them in the washer and the dryer all the time. Uh, they're in our gardens, they're in our potted plants inside. These stones wind up all over the place. And this is just a family full of girls. I can only imagine what the Coster's household looks like with all the rocks that they bring home. I'm praying for you guys. So wonderful stones. All of you with kids or have grown up and you have this like fond appreciation of stones, you can appreciate this. Stones and rocks are fascinating. They're absolutely fascinating. Uh, but despite all the cool rocks, and they are cool, don't get me wrong, girls, I don't think I do, will really call any of them wonderful. You know, it's not, they haven't quite gotten to that. Maybe if you find gold or diamond or something, I don't know if that qualifies as stone. I, that would be awesome. Keep looking. Um, but the disciple here is saying, what wonderful stones, what wonderful buildings. And this term wonderful is an expression that takes the form of a question. It literally means what manner of. So like when Jesus calmed the storms uh, in front of the disciples, the disciples responded in wonder with this question, what manner of man is this that can calm the storms? You're saying this is no regular man. This is no common man. This man is extraordinary. He's wonderful. We are in awe of him. And the same expression is used here of these stones, not putting them on the same level of Jesus at any way, but just so you can get this expression of wonder. These, these are not common. These are not everyday stones. They are awe-inspiring. So when we think of amazing stones, 
especially in regard to ancient civilization, what, do you, what would you think of? Anybody? Pyramid. Did anybody say pyramid? I couldn't hear. Okay, good job, John. Thank you. You think of the pyramids. I mean, you, all the documentaries you see on TV about ancient buildings and stones, it's going to be about the pyramid. Absolutely. You know, it's like the, the pyramids are amazing. And we immediately think about the pyramids, the stones, the engineering marvel, and how amazing it is that they could build the pyramids without modern technology. You know, how, how did they cut these stones? How did they transport these stones? How did they get these stones and they stack them up and, and place them so intricately? It's, uh, it's, it's so hard for us to uh, believe that, you know, people think that aliens might have built the, the uh, pyramids kind of thing. That's how awe-inspiring the pyramids are for us. But if you are in awe of the pyramids... I think you also have to be in awe of Herod's temple and the temple mount that was being built here. According to Wikipedia, the largest rock in the pyramids were slabs of granite. All right, these slabs of granite that were used for the king's chamber, and they weighed in at a whopping 80 tons. 80 tons. That's a lot of poundage to, to cut and to move and transport without modern, you know, uh, machinery that we have. 80 tons. We all agree that's massive, right? We all agree that's big. All right. Now get this. The largest rock used in the temple, in the, on the Temple Mount, that we can see to this day, and it's even got a name. It's called the Western Stone. I was going to put a picture up of, of it, but it's, it's down in a tunnel you can't get a good vantage point, and so you almost, you don't appreciate it because it's so big, and you just see somebody ne standing next to, it, it could be any rock. You just can't, it's so big, you can't get the proportions of it. But this stone in the Temple Mount, called the Western Stone, is 44 feet long by 11 feet high by, we don't know exactly how many feet deep, but they've used like some special radar they think it's between six to eight feet. Some people have estimated even further, deeper than that. All right, so just for proportions, I was trying to, Randy was helping me out a little bit, but I think from the little yellow flowers over there to the little yellow flowers over there on either side of the stage is about 44 feet. So it's just inside the black curtains, maybe four feet or so on each side probably. All right, so it's just inside the curtains, four feet on either side, it would be as tall as the curtains, almost as long as the curtains, and six to eight feet deep. That's how big the stone is. Do you, are you getting kind of an idea of the, of, the, of the scope of this a little bit? Now, the largest stone in the pyramids, the granite stone that weighed 80 tons, this stone in the temple weighed, and they're, they're guesstimating, they don't really have a scale to figure this out, but they're, they're figuring this out with science and all. 250 to 300 tons. If you're amazed at the pyramids, you need to be, your jaw needs to be dropping by just moving this one rock, cutting it and quarrying it, moving it, getting it placed over here. I want you to be in awe of what the disciples is seeing. And I'm not sure if he was looking at this one individual stone. He was looking at probably a lot of stones that had been quarried for the development of this temple. So 250 to 300 tons on the conservative estimate. That's heavier than a locomotive. That's heavier than your house. That's probably heavier than the, than the Statue of Liberty. This is like a big stone. And that's one rock, one amazing rock that was just a utilitarian piece of stone that was used in a foundation that people would probably never see. This was down in the tunnels. Now, if they used that type of stone down in the foundation of a structure, imagine what it was designed to hold up. Imagine the time that they would actually put into the stonework of things that the masses of people and the hundreds and thousands of people that come in are actually going to see and witness. Imagine how much time and effort they would have put into those stones and the surrounding porticos and the columns. They said there was a forest of columns inside of this temple complex area. And so imagine the beauty and the wonder that this disciple was expressing when he said this. What wonderful stones. What wonderful buildings. 
Now, the second temple, it's called King Herod's Temple. It was technically built by Zerubbabel. Poor guy got ripped off because another guy, King Herod, came along and remodeled it, and Zerubbabel's name got dropped. I feel kind of bad for the guy. But he built it after, um, after the first temple was destroyed, and uh, the Israelites, they, the Jews were in, um, what's the word for it? Exile. They came back from exile, and they, had, they rebuilt the temple. And it was a far cry from the beauty of what it was in Solomon's day, but they had the temple, and they could do the, the offerings and sacrifices. But in, in 20 years, uh, 20 BC, I think it was, King Herod started remodeling Zerubbabel's temple and made it, and I mean, he expanded it greatly and did some amazing upgrades, if you will, to it in his remodel. Remember, this is the same King Herod that was responsible for killing the male children under the age of three when he, the wise men came and talked about this prophecy of this new king. And so Herod, King Herod was a ruthless individual, but he was renowned for his colossal, colossal, <laughs> colossal building projects, of which the temple was the crown jewel. The temple was so ex excessively expanded and remodeled by Herod the Great, it was essentially a completely new temple altogether. And that's why we refer to it as Herod's Temple. It was said that even in all of its grandeur that Herod's Temple was a poor replacement for Solomon's Temple, but is one of the greatest building achievements in its own right at that time. Uh, a Roman historian said about, uh, he said that Emperor Titus, who was responsible for destroying this temple, said this about it. He said that, uh, he said, let me see where it says. It says that uh, uh, Emperor Titus said the temple was one of man's consummate building achievements, one of the greatest products of human endeavor. And so this is the Roman emperor who would have seen the finest architecture that Rome had to offer, looked at the temple and said, this is the consummate achievement of building an architecture, this temple that Herod had created and designed. There is a Roman Jewish historian, Josephus, who said this about the temple. He said it was, he described it. He says the entire facade was covered with gold and through it, the first edifice, the sanctuary beyond the porch was visible to a spectator without in all of its grandeur and the surrounding of the inner gate, all the gleaming, all gleaming with gold fell beneath his eye. The gate opening had moreover above it those golden vines from which uh, depended grape clusters as tall as a man and it had golden doors. He goes on to say the exterior of the building wanted nothing that could astound either mind or eye. For being covered on all sides with massive plates of gold, the sun was no sooner up than it radiated so fiery a flash that persons straining to look at it were compelled to avert their eyes as from the solar rays. I'll stop there in the description. This isn't just Jews that are describing this building as amazing and grand. This is the emperor. This is Jewish Roman historians. They're all saying this is an incredible, wonderful place. What wonderful stones. What wonderful buildings. And Jesus and his disciples were on the, had a front row seat to be able to see this temple being built right in front of them. And it was probably close to being completed, if not mostly completed in the time of Jesus. But they continued to do work on it right up until 64 AD, I think it is, six years before that it would be destroyed. Now I highlight, we spent a lot of time on the temple and on these stones and on these buildings. And the reason why is I want you to understand the impact or at least to have some form of appreciation of Jesus' next words and what they would have on the disciple who was just fascinated about these wonderful stones and these wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, and this is verse 2, do you see these great buildings? There will not be here one stone left upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, when I first read that, you know, that verse, Jesus' response, it kind of had the feeling like you're walking, you know, through the forest or your yard or something. You see a beautiful flower, you know, that's sprouting up and you kneel down and you're looking at all the intricacies and the beauty of it. And you're fascinated with it. And just as about you're about to comment on that beautiful flower, you know, a little boy comes over and goes, <laughs> you know, crushes it. And you're like, ah, you know, what wonderful flower. <laughs> flower. You know, it kind of has that feeling, that tension to it a little bit. Or if you're in, su or in nursery and helping out in there, you spend a lot of time, whole nursery period, like building up one of those cool towers with the blocks. And as soon as you get done with it, 
you know, you got one of the little kids that's been eyeing you the whole time is like, I'm going to knock it over. You know, that's kind of, that's what the feeling is. Oh, what a beautiful temple. What wonderful stones. What wonderful buildings. And here Jesus says, this temple is going to be destroyed. There's not going to be one stone left upon another. But I don't think Jesus is being harsh or vengeful here at all. Um, even though it seems like he would have the right to, because these are the people surrounding, the religious leaders surrounding the temple are going to condemn him to death in just a matter of days here. But I don't think he's being vengeful or harsh here. I don't think he's taking delight in this proclamation. I think Jesus' response to the disciple was one full of mournful sadness, much like he expressed in Luke. We, we referenced this verse a few weeks ago as well, and I'm going to read it again here. But Jesus' response, I think, is one of mournful sadness. Uh, much like in Luke 19 here, when Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem with his disciples, he was overlooking the city, and we are told that he wept over it. He wept over it. In verse 43, it says, Jesus, uh, it tells, Jesus foretold the coming destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. He says, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children with you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. And so Jesus has now multiple times foretold the coming destruction of the temple. Jesus is once again pronouncing God's coming judgment on Israel because they had not walked in faithful obedience to God and his covenant with Israel. Do you see these great buildings? They will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now, I want to point out here that even though Jesus is pronouncing God's judgment on the temple and on Israel as a whole, we would be remiss if we didn't, within that, also look for, within God's judgment, look for God's grace and love. Because we are told that God disciplines those he loves. And we are told that God works all things together for good. And it's really hard to look and see how can God be condemning this, this temple in Jerusalem? What possible good, loving, and good thing could come from that? And I want to answer that question in a form of some questions. And I want you to try to answer these in your own mind, and I'll answer them for you out loud. But I want to answer that question in a form of other questions. If God had not destroyed the temple, if God had not destroyed the temple, where would people think that God still dwells? In the temple. If God had not destroyed the temple, where would Christians feel like they might need to go to worship God? To the temple in Jerusalem. If God had not destroyed the temple, what would we think the temple was made of? Wonderful stones and rocks and gold. If God had not destroyed the temple, who would, uh, who would we think we needed to lead us into the presence of God? We would think we need perhaps priests to lead us into the presence of God. If God had not destroyed the temple, what would we be tempted to think was needed to cleanse us from our sins? Sacrifices of animals. If God had not destroyed the temple, what would symbolically still be separating God from man? An impenetrable veil of holiness, which no sinner could pass through into God's presence without dying. But because Jesus died, the price of sin has been paid. Because of that, the veil has been torn in the temple. And because God condemned this temple to destruction, this is the love and the good that came from this. Because God condemned the temple to destruction, we know there is a new temple, right? Made of living stones, people. And we know that the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. This is important for us as Christians to know. What happened to the previous two temples? They were destroyed. But this new temple, the temple made of living stones and God's people, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Because God condemned the temple to destruction, we know that our sins have been covered once and for all through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Because God condemned the temple to destruction, we know that we can enter directly into the presence of God through our great high priest, whose name is Jesus. We can do that at any time, in any place. Because, uh, because uh, God condemned the temple to destruction, we know that the temple of God, his church, 
is being sent into all the world to tell the nations about the good news of the gospel. God isn't waiting for the nations to come to that temple in Jerusalem. He's sending his temple to the nations. Do you see the, the love of God within this, this, uh, com, this uh, statement of, of judgment and condemnation on the temple? He's saying something new and better is com- coming. Herod's temple was wonderful. Solomon's temple was amazing. But God's church is on a whole nother level. It's so incredible that Jesus would die for it. He loves it so much that he calls it his bride. And kids, in your, in your little kid's sheet there, it says God's church is so much bigger and grander than any building. And it is. There's no building that can convey what God's temple is supposed to be and the relationship it's supposed to, to hold between God and his people. So we have this, uh, this statement from Jesus. Do you see these great buildings? They will not be left here, one stone upon another. That will not be thrown down. Now, I think Jesus said that with great sadness, like we saw when he came into Jerusalem. But I think he also is saying that with great joy and love and anticipation because the new temple is coming. The old is passing away and the new is coming. And that is something that at the same time is bringing Jesus, I think, grief and sadness, but is bringing him joy and anticipation about this new and better temple that is God's church. The church that was just about to be there, to be built and to come. Now let's get back to the disciples. We had this very first uh, question and reply from Jesus as they were leaving the temple, but now they were on the side of the Mount of Olives, probably sitting down and overlooking back towards Jerusalem and looking at these wonderful buildings and stones from this distance. Now, I'm not sure if we can fully appreciate the gravity of what Jesus is saying and how it would hit the disciples at that time. The temple was the single most important place in Israel. It wasn't just symbolic of Israel. It was the heart and soul of everything that Israel was. It was their national identity. They were God's chosen people, a nation set apart for God. And this was God's house. All aspects of life in Israel revolved around the temple, not just religious, but also social, political, and even economics. The temple was God's dwelling place. It was a place a holy God could be present with sinful men. And as we learned about last week, uh, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the temple was one of the most important places that the Israelites would come and show that love for God by obediently offering those sacrifices and worshiping and praying to God. I think the closest we could get to in our own experiences of mine of being able to sympathize with the disciples and what this news and how it would hit them, I think the closest thing we can get to understanding that is looking back on our own 9-11. Back when Al-Qaeda um, you know, terrorists hijacked four planes and flew two of them into the World Trade Center towers, flew another one into the Pentagon, and I think we're aiming the other one for the White House, but ended up going down out in Pennsylvania and that rural area. But you remember the weight, you know, of, of that, that, the way that that hit you when you first heard about that happening. We've been attacked. Something bad's happening. We are being attacked in a bigger way than just us individually. Even though most of us were safe. We were far away from where the danger lied. That danger had this way of impacting all of us. You know, it's like that security blanket that, that we felt like we were laid bare. And I think that's similar, uh, the, probably the closest we can even imagine to what the disciples would feel when they hear about this coming judgment that Jesus is pronouncing on the temple. What happened on 9-11 was horrific and terrible, But I'm not sure if there's any one building or a collective group of buildings that would, um, that, you know, could be destroyed that would have the same impact or effect on us as the destruction of the temple did for the disciples. But I I think it's important as we look and study at this passage that we try to sympathize with the gravity and weight of what Jesus is telling them will come to pass. Now remember, the disciples have already struggled significantly to comprehend how Jesus, who is the Messiah and is the King, is going to come and suffer and die. That's that's hard to wrap your mind around. But now, not only is this Messiah King 
not going to rain the way that the disciples thought he would immediately there. Not only that, but the city and the temple from which he should rule and reign over as the Messiah King is also going to be destroyed. Do you see the struggle that the disciples would be going through in this scenario? This is difficult. And so this whole idea of the kingdom of God doesn't seem to be getting off to a wonderful start. The king is going to suffer and die. And the place from which he should reign is going to be destroyed. Not one stone upon another. Feel the gravity and weight of it. I want you to know that victory does not always look like victory at the time. Victory does not always look like victory at that time. I've heard this analogy used, um, and I think it's a really good one, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it. It's not mine original to me. But I've heard people refer to what Jesus did in this time and space as being similar to what happened on D-Day during World War II. On June 2nd, 1944, some of you, I don't know if any of you remember that date. I don't know. Don't raise your hand. I don't know if you have to. June 6th, 1944. D-Day, in the largest amphibious evasion in history, Allied forces landed on the beaches of France and invaded Europe. After that, that fateful day, D-Day, Hitler was finished. It was done. Um, Hitler was finished. It was just a matter of time. But that was the day that the war was essentially won. Hitler was done for. But on that day, on D-Day, 4,114 men died. It doesn't feel like victory, though, does it? You're like, yeah, that was the day the war was won. Everything changed after that. It was just a matter of time. But that day, 4,114 men died. Victory doesn't always feel like victory or look like victory immediately. But following that day, many, many more men would die. The cities across Europe would be laid waste and be destroyed, but the war had been won. It was just a matter of finishing the battles. And I think in a similar fashion, Jesus had landed, if you will. God incarnate, God made flesh, and he would die, but he would rise again. And Satan would be defeated, finished, but it was just a matter of time. The war was won, but there were still more battles to be fought. And that is what Jesus is preparing his disciples for here, I think, in the Olivet Discourse. He's preparing them for that spiritual D-Day invasion that is only days away from them talking on the Mount of Olives. He's saying that the war will be won. And in fact, in just a couple of days, he's going to go to the cross and he is going to suffer and die. Jesus is going to die. But the war is won. And Jesus is preparing them for what's coming next. He's like, guys, the war has been won. But I want you to know there's still more battles to be fought. But you can be confident in knowing that we have won. There will be more struggle. There will be more battles. But don't be fooled. Don't be led astray. Don't be alarmed. You are saved. Now, I want us to read through the rest of this passage through verse 13. And I want you to read through it in that light. That the, the war has been won, but there are still more battles to be fought. So let's continue reading in chapter 13, verses 3 through 13. It says, As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite of the temple with Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, they asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? And Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of the birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues on account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them and brought to trial. Do not worry beforehand about what you will say. Uh, what you'll say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. 
Brother will betray brother to death, and father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And so Peter, James, John, and Andrew, these four disciples specifically, are querying Jesus about the, the destruction of the temple and when this is going to come and what's happening next. They want to know what this next phase of the battle is going to look like. They want to look, know what to look for and expect. And remember, just a week ago, the disciples were asking questions about where they're going to sit on the right hand or the left hand of Jesus in this new kingdom. Remember, they were ready for this phase of like the, the wars won, we're victorious. They're ready for the victory celebration. And now they're coming to the realization, it's not time for the victory celebration yet. The, the D-Day, Jesus landed, he's going to the cross, he's going to suffer and die. And I think they're, they're starting to slowly come to that realization, realization that they've got a lot bigger fish to fry than fighting over seats at, at the, you know, the, the supper with Jesus. There's a lot more battle still to come. And their thinking is being stretched significantly in this way. And so the disciples question, they're asking, when is the temple going to be destroyed? When are these things going to happen and take place? What are the signs of the times? And throughout the Olivet Discourse, Jesus goes into more detail and provides some of the answers. And since his answers are, uh, you know, again, in the course of one chapter, cover the spans of thousands of years, we're not going to hit on all of it this morning. Pastor Preston, in two weeks, will answer all of your questions about end times and the coming fulfillment of prophecy and when Jesus will return. I'm just trying to set him up like a good brother. You're welcome, Preston. But Jesus starts very beginning of answering this question. And he does so by giving the disciples their mission. Again, the war's been won, but there's more battles to come. This is our mission. This is the invasion of Europe, if you will. This is what's coming next of what's going to happen and what you need to expect. And he gives them their mission, uh, their mission, their call. What are you going to do? What is your main focus here? And, uh, and so as he's going through that, he, I'll point to verse 10. Verse 10, Jesus gives them the mission. He says, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. What's got to happen before the end of times? The one thing that the Israel, Israelites were told to do with the first temple and the second temple, what? It was supposed to be a place of prayer for all nations to come. Did they succeed in that mission? No, they didn't. We have the third temple, which is God's church. Temple of God's church, us, people. And we are told that that temple is supposed to go into all nations. God is sending his temple to all nations. And we're told in this verse that before all these things can transpire and the second coming of Jesus comes, you have this mission. The, you must first bring the gospel to all nations. This sounds very familiar to what Jesus would later say in the Great Commission after he resurrected and was talking with his disciples before, uh, before he ascended. In Matthew 28, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Do you hear? He keeps giving the mission statement. The, the war has been won. More battles to come. The gospel still it has not yet gone to all nations. Those temples have not done what God wanted them to do. His temple, the church, is now going to do that. And this is what it's going to look like. He's preparing them. It's still going to be hard. And there's still going to be difficulties and trials and tribulations. And that's what these warnings in this passage are all about. Jesus gives four warnings about things that will get them off mission if they are not careful. These things will tempt you to get your eyes and your focus and your mind on something else that will not fulfill what God is calling us to do as his church. And these four warnings, he says, do not be deceived. He says, do not be alarmed. He says, be on your guard. He says, stand firm. So the first one, he says, don't be deceived. In verses five through six, Jesus said to them, watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. On your kids' sheets, uh, probably a more simple way of looking at this same idea, Jesus told his disciples to watch out for liars who would pretend to be him. Now, in any wartime uh, period, uh, deception is one of the greatest tactics that, uh, that opposing armies can use towards each other. 
The power of deception is incredible. And there's probably no greater deception that you could play on the opposition than to pretend to be their general or their leader. If you can pretend to be their, the leader of the opposing army, it doesn't matter how strong the army is, they have now lost any power over you. They're not going to wield that in a way that could defeat you. And here Jesus is saying that one of the greatest distractions that will come in, in, towards you in this new phase of the battle is that people will come and pretend to be me. They are going to pretend to be me and they are going to try to lead you astray and keep, get you off mission. That's what they're going to do. And so Jesus is saying, watch out. Watch out for those posers, those people who claim to be me and lead you astray. That was true in the time of the apostles. That's true over the last 2,000 years. And that will continue to be true till Jesus returns. This is true. There is deception all around us and we must watch out. On a historical note, though, I don't think it's a coincidence that as we look at that picture of the Temple Mount, that there is a mosque and the Dome of the Rock that is sitting on top of where the temple once stood. Islam is attempting to fill the void, reducing the significance of Jesus and claiming that Muhammad is Allah's prophet, claiming that Muhammad is showing us the right way. And you see, I, I don't think that's a coincidence that's happening on the very temple itself. But we must watch out. And that's just one visible example. History is full of people claiming to be Jesus. I, I looked this up on the internet and it went to a, all different sorts of places and Wikipedia. And it was, it was amazing how they listed by the centuries all the different people in each century that claimed to be Jesus. Whether reincarnated Jesus or a second coming of Jesus, I've returned. This has happened for centuries it's happening now in my own lifetime. I can point to a few. David Koresh, Branch Davidians. Did anybody remember that back in the day? Uh, Jim Jones. Don't judge everyone named Jim Jones. It's probably a very common name. But there was one that was really bad and claimed to be Jesus. Don't follow him. Uh, Charles Manson, another guy, claimed to be Jesus. You have these people all around us that are trying to pose like they are Christ to lead his people astray. In Mark 12, 24, the question is, how do we keep from being led astray? Mark 12, 24, Jesus told them, and John Paternoster shared this with us a few weeks ago. He said, is not this the reason that you are wrong, talking to the religious leaders who were very wrong? Because you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. If you know the scriptures and the power of God, you will not be led astray. Okay, got to go to God's word. That's how we uh, maintain, you know, we, that's how we, we keep from being deceived. In 1 John 4, 1, we're told, uh, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into this world. So we're told, you know, watch out. How do we do that? How do we test the spirits? We go to God's word and see if they, what they're saying lines up with what God has already told us. And then finally, in Acts 20, 28, one of the ways we keep from de being deceived is we're a part of God's church. In Acts 20, 28, Paul calls the uh, elders from the church in Ephesus, and he tells them this. He says, be on guard for yourselves, elders. He says, also be on guard for all the flock, which the, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. He says, to shepherd the flock of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Why do we need a shepherd? We need, because we need to guard we need to guard. That's why church, part of the reason that church is so important is, is you have leaders that are called to help guard and you are called to help guard each other. This isn't just somebody has a responsibility and other people don't. We have this mutual responsibility to watch out for each other. And when people crop up on the internet, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've heard through the years, many years, people will come and say, I've heard this on the internet. I saw this video on the internet. This person is saying this. This guy from Israel, he's a, he's a guy, you know, within the, um, uh, the Israel Defense Forces, and he's saying this. And it's like, guys, you know, there's a lot going on out there, and we have to be discerning and hold it up to God's word and saying, is, is this worth our time, or is this just deception getting us off track of our mission, which is to bring the gospel to all the world? So don't be deceived. The second one is do not be alarmed. Expect turmoil in the world around you. I think there's a lot of Christians that think that when we get saved, turmoil should go away. That there shouldn't be hardship and difficulty. But in verse 7 through 8, 
Jesus saying, when you hear of wars and rumors of war, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. Not might happen. They must happen. God's saying these have to happen. And you need to expect that they will happen. But the end is still to come. So that will continue from the time of Jesus until his second coming. These are going to continue happening. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. And these are the beginning of the birth pains. So kids sheet, just an easy way of thinking about this is Jesus told his disciples not to be afraid when scary things were happening in the world around them. There's wars, rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, natural disasters, earthquakes, famine. This was true in the disciples' time. This has been true for the last 2,000 years and will continue to be true to the second coming of Jesus. These things are happening, but God's given us a mission to stay focused on. These things can be a distraction force and get our eyes off of where they need to be. Our response should be the same as what Jesus called his disciples' response to be. Don't be alarmed. Cool dog. Chill out. Jesus told us these things would happen. Don't be surprised when they happen. Don't be alarmed. Because, well, let's say why. Why shouldn't we be alarmed? One, because God is in control. God told us these things are going to happen. They're happening. Why should we be alarmed when God, the very thing God told us has happened is happening? We can take comfort knowing that God is in control. The war has been won, but there's still battles to be fought. We, can, we should not be alarmed because when we are alarmed, we tend to focus on that thing that is causing us fear. When we're afraid of something, we tend to respond to that thing that we are, are afraid of. And I, I want to be cautious because, you know, famines and there's things that we need to do practically in this life. I'm not saying you turn a complete blind eye and don't address some of these needs that are going on in the world. I'm not saying that. But there's a place when we become, when we're alarmed and we start walking in fear in our life and towards those things that are happening, we stop thinking about the gospel and what Jesus has called us to and furthering the gospel into all the world. We've got to remember what our battle is and who our battle is against. Like Ephesians 6 says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers and authorities against the powers of this dark world the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Don't get distracted by the things going on, all these things going on, tumult, tumult between men. There's a bigger battle that is being waged. And that's the battle we've been called to, uh, to fight. So if we get our eyes fixed on the worldly battle, we're going to lose sight of the spiritual battle and be led astray. The third thing that we are told here is to be on your guard. Not only is turmoil happening around us in the world, in the nations and kingdoms, and wars, famines, natural disasters, but we can expect turmoil in our own life. Jesus says in verses 9 through 12, he says, you must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, don't worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time. For it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father is child. And children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. That's like the definition of turmoil. I almost could care less about the wars and rumors of war and everything that's going on in the world around us. Now it's getting personal. This is the stuff that's affecting me. You know, this is, now it's getting like serious and real because like you're going to be thrown in jail. You're going to be persecuted in all these different ways. This is hard for us to expect. But this is what Jesus told his disciples, the apostles. I think this is also what he is telling to us, his Christ followers today. It was true for them then, back 2,000 years ago. It's been true up till today. And I think this is going to be true till the time that Jesus returned this command for us to be on our guard and that these things will happen. Expect turmoil, trials, and tribulation. This was true of the apostles. Almost all of the apostles were martyred for the faith, except for John, who was exiled. It's been true for countless other Christians over the last 2,000 years. Read the Fox's Book of Martyrs if you haven't already. It is chock full of Christians through the centuries who have remained faithful through this kind of turmoil. And then 
Christian persecution continues to happen to this day at a fever pitch. Uh, I've, I've read uh, statistics and numbers, and they can be hard to figure out exactly. But many will say that more Christians are being killed and martyred today in Christendom than throughout all previous uh, 2,000 years leading up to this point. Persecution has not gone away. It is still existent here in the church and very present. John 15, 20 says, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. And he told us, how will they be persecuted? There's religious persecution here first. You're going to be flogged in the synagogues. What's the second way? Political persecution. You're going to stand before governors and kings. You're going to be arrested and brought to trial. That is what Christians need to expect to happen when we are standing firm on the faith. There's going to be family persecution. Brothers betray brother, father his child, children against parents. There's going to be family persecution. And that's why we need to be on our guard, our guard and not falter and keep our eyes fixed on the prize. Romans 8, 18, whenever I think about suffering and trials, uh, that's a tough sell when you're going and, and sharing the gospel with people and witnessing to them. And they're like, yeah, I want to go to heaven one day and be with Christ and be with God. But as you're like sharing what that means right now, the war has been won. And that's great. People love to latch onto that. But it's really hard to say, but there's still a battle to be fought. And this is the cost of the battle. Before Hitler fell, there was many more casualties of those battles. There was a lot more hardship to come before V-Day finally happened. And we've got to be prepared for that same thing as Christians in the Christian walk. We walk with the confidence and security knowing that Jesus has won. But we need to also go into the world sharing the gospel to all nations and ready for these per persecutions to come. We shouldn't be surprised like even in America, yes, there hasn't been a lot of religious persecution in America for years. You know what? That's not what Jesus promised. I'm thankful for it, and I hope it continues. But Jesus promised religious persecution, political persecution, family persecution, and says, don't be alarmed. Be on guard. Be ready for it. And this verse in Romans 18, whenever I think about suffering and trials, is one of those great comforting verses. It says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be the, uh, compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. That's hard for me when I'm going through sufferings to think any, about anything other than that suffering. But when we finally are in a headspace where we can stop and think about and compare all of the sufferings and trials and the and throughout history, for all the Christians, we pile them up, all the sufferings and trials, and heap them up in one big pile and weight them against the glory that God's going to reveal in his church. There's no comparison that can't be compared at all. It's futile. It's a waste of time. And that is a verse we need to seize hold of so we're not alarmed, knowing that there is meaning to the struggle. There is, there is value in what God is going to do and bringing um, and, and giving us that fullness of joy in God and his goodness and love. And so the last point as we get ready to close is stand firm. You will be saved. Have hope. Like it says in verse 13, everyone will hate you. Talk about suffering. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm till the end will be saved. Your kid sheet, it says, Jesus promises to save those who trust him to the end. So the one that endures to the end will be saved. Now, I want to clarify real quick here that this is not saying that our endurance saves us. We, do not, we do, are not saved by our works and enduring to the end. I want to be very clear with that. We are saved by God's grace through faith in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. But what this is saying is that what I think Philippians 1, 6 says, that I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in us will continue it till the day of Christ. And he's going to continue it through all of these trials and tribulations. That's why Psalms 23 is so special to many of us is because we've walked through those. You have walked through. I've walked through some of those trials. And we know that God has never left us or forsaken us. He's walked us through the valley of the shadow of death. And 
our salvation is proved by God's faithfulness through the trials that leads us to salvation. And we can be confident in that. Say, so, so he who began a good work in you will complete it. The war has been won, and now it just needs to be completed.